Hello everyone and welcome to the physics basement. So today we're going to be introducing some of the uncertainty quantities that you'll need to know for your physics labs. So here's some of the important concepts that we're going to be going through in this lecture. We're going to talk about the two different types of measurement error or measurement uncertainty. Uh, there is statistical, otherwise known as random error, which has to do with the number of data points that you have, and there's systematic uncertainty, which has to do with the way that you're performing your experiment, not how much data you're taking, but the way in which you are taking your data. So for example, if you had faulty equipment, that would fall under systematic error. Statistical error is something else, which usually is the type of, which is the type of thing that you can get rid of just by taking more data. Within statistical uncertainty, we'll talk about the difference between populations and samples. A data sample is what you collect in the lab, and a population is a hypothetical thing that we use to understand certain properties about our sample, the sample of data that we have taken, and the uncertainty on measurements within that sample We'll talk about some of the important quantities that go along with statistical uncertainties like the mean standard deviation, sample standard deviation, and then the error on the mean. We'll talk a bit more about systematic uncertainties and how they are difficult to quantify, how we can get an estimation of them, and the ways in which the, the sources of systematic uncertainty that creep its way into our data sets. Finally, I'll give you some warnings on notation and propagation and the exact formulas that uh, you can use to, to quantify uncertainties. I've included here a picture that's actually from my thesis. So you'll see that there's a bunch of dots there. Those are the central data points. And then there's error bars extending out in either direction. This is a plot that is actually quantifying a systematic uncertainty, or at least one source of systematic uncertainty in the measurement of the mass of galaxy clusters. Uh, I'll talk a bit about error bars and uh, how, how you go about uh, finding systematic uncertainties later on. So here's a question for you. Uh, I know that intuition tells you that taking more data will lead to smaller uncertainties on your measurements, right? But what if there is a human error that introduces a bias uh, in your measurement? So let's say you're measuring the length of something and you're using a faulty ruler or you don't quite understand that the zero point on the ruler is slightly offset from the end of the ruler and so you're measuring from the wrong point and it's, there's an operator error. Obviously taking a whole bunch more data, making a whole bunch of different measurements is not going to help you reduce that uncertainty. But yet it does make sense that more data should lead to smaller uncertainties, right? So the discrepancy just comes in from two different kinds of systematic errors, uh, sorry, two different kinds of errors or uncertainties in your measurements. There are statistical errors, which are determined by the amount of data you have. And statistical errors are kind of nice in that if you want to have smaller statistical errors. If you want a more precise measurement, you can just take more data. And we also have some nice formulas to determine statistical error. Systematic error, on the other hand, is systemic to your experiment. If you want smaller systematic errors, you're going to have to improve your experiment. You're gonna to have to buy better equipment, come up with better techniques, be more precise in the way you're going about making measurements, you're going to have to fix your experiment. There's no formulas 
for systematic errors. There's some good rules of thumb. We're not completely in the dark when it comes to quantifying systematic errors, but they are hard to quantify. And for the purposes of our intro physics classes, for the most part, we're going to come up with best guesses when it comes to systematic errors. So an example would be the smallest increment of your measuring device is an approximation of the uncertainty uh, of one source of uncertainty. Say, if you're measuring the length of something, then the tick marks on a ruler are kind of a lower bound on the overall systematic uncertainty. So let's talk about statistical errors. There are, when, when you take a data set, what you have is a sample distribution of data. So here on the right, I have a picture that says, uh, it's the distribution, a sample distribution taken quantifying the time between the first and second bounce of a ping pong ball that's dropped from a height of one meter. So on the x-axis, there is the time between bounces, and this is in units of hundredths of a second. And on the y-axis, it says the number of times that each one of these uh, has been measured. So the frequency at which uh, each of these measurements were taken. So 76 uh, hundredths of a second was measured three times, 77 hundredths of a second was measured four times, and so on. So this is called a histogram. And this histogram represents the sample distribution, the amount of data that was taken. Now, if you think about it, in theory, you could take more data, right? And if you think of the limiting case where you're taking a infinite number of data points, uh, that's called the population. Now, if you want, you couldn't really make a histogram uh, when it comes to the population, but what you could do instead of plotting on the y-axis the number of times something was measured, you could instead give the fraction of times that you measured this particular uh, this particular time. So those are two key words there. Sample distribution is what you have taken. And then population is this limiting case where we have, uh, it's a hypothetical thing where you think about having, well, much, much larger amounts of data up to an infinite number of data points. So then you can think of your sample as being a subset of that population. And the larger your sample is, the more likely it is to be shaped like the population is. So populations are interesting. They tend to have this characteristic shape of being Gaussian. So here is a, a picture on the right of the Gaussian distribution, also known as the normal distribution. And what it shows is some mean value and then some kind of hump around the mean. It's peaked at the mean and it tapers off on either side. And there's a really simple uh, rudimentary explanation for why populations uh, tend to be Gaussian. Uh, just oftentimes missing high or missing low around some central value is equally likely. And so you get something that tapers off like this. That, that's only part of the story. There's also things like the mean value theorem, uh, which I will not go into. You can look, up, uh, look it up on Wikipedia if you're interested. But uh, there's plenty of reasons why populations tend to be uh, Gaussian distributed or normal distributed. And the fact is that if you take a whole bunch of data, the larger amount of data that you take, it will, you will tend to have a sample that looks a lot more like this, like this nice Gaussian here, this hump that's symmetrical on either side and drops off around some central or mean value. 
So if I take t to be the time between two bounces of a ping pong ball that's dropped from a height of one meter, then I can talk about some properties of the Gaussian distribution of the measured value t. Uh, the, the distribution of t will be roughly Gaussian. When you think about this particular experiment, you might be a little bit quick uh, quick on the trigger with your measurement, uh, so your stopwatch measurement, say one time and then a little bit lethargic or slow or behind on the next one. Uh, the experimenter might drop something from 101 centimeters one time uh, and then 99 centimeters the next time, right, peaking around this perfect value of one meter. So you would get this kind of spread around some central value. Now the mean or the location of the peak is a quantity that you're already familiar with, right? This is just the arithmetic mean or the average here, T bar is the syntax we use to, uh, to give the average, to denote the average. Sometimes you'll also see mu, the Greek letter mu indicates the mean. I prefer T bar. And the other thing that describes the shape of a Gaussian distribution is called the standard deviation, which characterizes the width of the hump here. So to calculate the standard deviation, you'd follow this, uh, you would use this formula here, where you take the square root of one over N times the sum of these square offsets from the true value. And you can see how the, so for these TIs here are each of the individual measurements that you make. Say that you've made 30 measurements of T, done 30 different trials. You would have to take the difference between each one of those and the true value, square that difference, and then sum all those together to get that, uh, that thing inside of the radical and then divide that by n and take the square root to get the standard deviation. And there's nice properties about this uh, Gaussian distribution, which says that you can expect 68% of data points to fall within one sigma of the mean. So one sigma is uh, means that if you go out to the left of the mean, uh, a width of one, one sigma, the one standard deviation, and take all the data points from there over to the point where you're one standard deviation to the right of the mean, then count up all of the data points that fall between those two values, and it's roughly 68% uh, that you, you will expect to see roughly 68% of your data within that, uh, within that range. So 68% is pretty close to about two thirds of your measurements. Um, and by the other properties of the Gaussian distribution, the way that it tapers off uh, as you go to very small or very large values, that uh, expectation value at two sigma out to the, uh, from mu minus two sigma to mu plus two sigma should incorporate about 95% of your data. And if you go out one more sigma and pick that range from mu minus three sigma to mu plus three sigma, that's about 99% of your data. So this is nice and uh, helpful when we start to talk about uh, comparisons between say two different data sets. You might wonder or uh, comparisons between two different individual measurements as well. So you might wonder, so you might be wondering why even talk about this population thing, this theoretical li limiting case of having an infinite number of data points. Uh, we don't, obviously we don't possess this population. We only have a sample. So what good does this do us? Well, we can estimate uh, the properties of the population. And the mean of our sample is a good estimation of the population mean. So we can use this same formula here, uh, 
to estimate the mean of the population. Uh, the same thing is not quite true, though, for this stamp, uh, the standard deviation. We can't use the sample standard deviation uh, in the exact same way because the sigma t is just not going to work since t true is unknown, right? We, we can't take this these differences between our individual measurements and the true measurement because we don't actually know t true right? At least we don't in this case, right? It's possible that you could be measuring something where you do know the true value. And in that case, you could use this formula. But instead, uh, in the case where we don't know t true, we use what's called the sample standard deviation. And so we denote that by s sub t uh, instead of sigma sub t. It has a slightly different functional form. You'll notice that there's that one over n minus one in the denominator instead of one over n. And there's the t bar or the mean standing in the place where t true had been. And the idea is that uh, s sub t in the limit where you go to very large numbers n will tend towards the value sigma sub t. Uh, if you're wondering why that 1 over n became a 1 over n minus 1, it's because in that limiting case where n gets really large, s sub t in that form there with the 1 over n minus 1 in it tends toward sigma, uh, sigma sub t, and it will not tend towards that value. It will be slightly biased uh, if you have a 1 over n in there instead of a 1 over n minus 1. So this is what we call an unbiased estimator of the population standard deviation. OK. And then we have these same nice properties that hold for our, our data, right? 68% then can fall within uh, one sample standard deviation of the mean and it'll be 95%, say, at two standard deviations, and at three standard deviations, it's about 99%, like 99.7. So this is great because now we can relate the two properties and we can use the things that we know about a population and its Gaussian shape to understand properties of our sample and also our individual measurements. OK, so now we can get into actual uncertainties on measurements and error bars. So it's standard practice to take the statistical uncertainty on a measurement or the error bar uh, or the error in general to be that interval which encompasses 68% of the data. We use in physics 1 and 2 and 3 delta t to denote the uncertainty on t. Uh, this syntax is, it can be very confusing for students. When people see delta t, they think that's a time interval, t2 minus t1, that kind of thing. But in the context of when we're talking about uncertainties, like in a lab packet or something, that always means the uncertainty on t. You can see why delta t kind of makes sense, right? Delta t is, uh, is a deviation in the parameter t. So uh, an uncertainty is like a deviation around the true value. So, uh, but just so you know, that's the way that the lab packets treat it. So that's the syntax that I use. And it can be confusing sometimes. And you're not going to see it written like that uh, anywhere else for the most part. So the sample standard deviation then is the statistical uncertainty on each specific measurement ti. So it's the uncertainty on each individual measurement, right? Because it makes up that 68% uh, confidence interval surrounding uh, each value that you've measured. So just for example, this example here just is laid out to show you the, the proper way to talk about uncertainties and exactly what it means, uh, exactly what that, that third bullet point there means. Uh, 
So let's take an example and say I've measured uh, that the sample standard deviation is 0 0.02 seconds for my data set, and I'm going to ignore systematic errors for this, uh, the purposes of this illustration. Then here's some things I can say about the specific measurement T, I chose T5, so the fifth measurement, say, uh, I made was 0 0.82 seconds. So here's some of the things I can say, uh, true things I can say about this. So the statistical uncertainty on T5 is 0 0.02 seconds. That's a correct thing to say. Uh, the proper way to write this measurement then, by the way, would be to say uh, we measured T5 equals 0 0.82 plus or minus 0 0.02 seconds. That plus or minus then gives that, uh, it, it gives that interval, that 68% confidence interval surrounding the central value that you measured. So that's the proper way to write the measurement. Uh, there's a 68% chance then that the true value of T5 is between 0.8 and 0.84 seconds. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about a 68% confidence interval. What that means is that uh, if I have some true value, now note that I'm, I'm ignoring systematic errors right now in the example that I'm talking about, but uh, there is some true value of T5, some true value of the time that it took for in the fifth, uh, the fifth iteration of this experiment for the ping pong ball uh, to bounce. And that value, uh, whatever that true value is, we have reason to suspect that there is a 68% chance that that true value of T5 is between 0.80 seconds and 0.84 seconds. Right. We have reason to believe this because this is what we know to be the case based on what we measured and based on the statistics uh, that we've done. So now a bit about comparison between different measurements. So if another student had come up, they watched the exact same ping pong ball fly and they measured 0.84 seconds, then you might wonder, uh, is that consistent? Did somebody do something wrong because you got two different values? Is that pretty close? Is that really far? Um, but if you know statistics, you'll be able to understand how to talk about these things properly. So if that student got 0.84 seconds and you got 0.82 seconds, in this case where uh, S sub T is 0.02 seconds, you can say that they're consistent because it's within the uncertainty. The, their value falls within your error bars and that's the heart of a consistent, of two consistent measurements. Now, if the student had measured something like 0.96 seconds, then you could say these two things are inconsistent. Okay, the value 0.96 seconds is actually seven factors of the standard deviation away. We call that a seven sigma discrepancy. Uh, so the confidence interval for three sigma was 99%, right? Out, once you get out to seven sigma, you're now in the regime where it's so unlikely that uh, you would ever come up with a measurement that's seven sigma discrepant from another measurement of the same thing and have them both be that be due to random chance. Uh, so that means that somebody must have done something wrong. Uh, you should redo your measurement or something. Okay. Now, if the student had measured T5 of 0.86 seconds, so here this is between the two values there, uh, you would have to conclude that it's outside of your error bars, but it's only outside by a factor of two sigma, right? Two sigma denotes the 95% confidence interval. So it's a bit ambiguous, like whether these measurements agree or not. At that level, there's no reason to say, oh, somebody must have done something wrong. Uh, but yet at the same time, you can't 
just flat out say, yeah, they're consistent. Um, it's likely that there's nothing going on wrong there. If nobody can think of anything specific that might have brought about a discrepancy. But if you see, say, a two sigma discrepancy and somebody was like, yeah, I kind of thought that my finger slipped when I went to touch the stopwatch the second time and so I kind of had to touch it again, then you would conclude, yeah, that, that's an errant measurement and that uh, should be redone. Now, what about the uncertainty on the average? For that, I would like to use a little simulation. All right, here I've got an example of a fairly random process. Uh, if I were to hit this button over here, it will release a ball that goes through a Plinko board and falls into a spot down below. Let's reset this thing. So you notice if I drop this thing down and it uh, there was no Plinko board, let's say, it would just fall right here for the most part, right? It might hit the edge and it might bounce out over here or over there or something like that, but uh, for the most part, it would drop down right here. Uh, there is uh, the Plinko board here just kind of magnifies this, uh, the uncertainty so that you can see things a, a little bit better. So let's go and release 10 balls. You can see that as they fall down, uh, every peg that they hit on the Plinko board, they just are simulated to have this 50% probability of going to the left or 50% uh, probability of going to the right. And what you get is uh, 10 things. You can see that the most, most of them did end up in the most likely spot, the one right beneath. If I do 10 more, uh, I'll have a different distribution. And these uh, spots down here, where the tubes are getting filled up are very much like a histogram. So this simulation will let me do a histogram as well. So let's take a histogram and fill it up with these, the final position of these Plinko balls. So, all right, now you can see a whole bunch have gone in there. And the other thing that's nice about the simulation is that it lets me plot the ideal uh, or the population value down below if I want to. Now let's start this thing over again. So this is the ideal or the population, right? And I'm going to gather a sample. At first, the sample just has one ball, two balls, three balls, something like that. And it looks like this. You know, it's not going to look very much like the population to begin with. However, if I let a lot of the balls fall down. Over time, this thing will, the red bars will gather more and more data, and they will steadily start to look a lot more like those blue balls. And something else you notice is right over here, the average value is kind of hovering right around uh, the ideal value for the mean, and the standard deviation is kind of just jumping back and forth. It doesn't uh, seem to be going in any direction, but this value here is going down as more and more balls are collected. This value is the error on the mean. It's the uncertainty on not an individual measurement. Of course, the uncertainty on the individual one is this value here, the sample standard deviation. This is the uncertainty on the mean value. And it makes sense that as we're collecting more data, that the standard deviation isn't necessarily going down over time or up over time. It's just kind of hovering around its true value because the standard deviation is going to be just a property of how much the Plinko board spreads out the balls. Should be totally independent of the number of balls that have fallen through it. But the mean, the uncertainty on the mean value should be going down with time, right? The mean value that we've measured will get more and more precise the more and more data that we collect. And it turns out that the error on the mean falls like one over the square root of the number of measurements that we acquire. So the error on the mean is equal to the sample standard deviation divided by root n, where n is the number of data points that we've taken.
So this, these blue bars now are starting to overlap quite nicely with the red bars as this uh, goes over through time. Let's take a look at what this looks like after I've collected up to 6,000, uh, exceeding 6,000 balls. Now you can see that the red bars and the blue bars really overlap quite nicely. The mean and uh, the population mean and the sample mean are very, very close as are the sample standard deviation and the population standard deviation. And the error on the mean is now quite low, right? It's getting incredibly low. This shows how this population distribution here actually is useful. It's not just a hypothetical thing, right? We actually do approach this thing, even in a random process, we can take uh, enough data points such that we can get something that looks at least a little bit like the population distribution. We've been talking about the uncertainty on each measurement. Now let's transition and talk about the uncertainty on an average of measurements. So we'll go from this denotes the uncertainty on a time, right? This goes, we're going to transition to talking about the uncertainty on the average time and from the ensemble average to this quantity called the error on the mean. So the error on the mean is the uncertainty of the average time, and it's equal to the sample standard deviation divided by root n, where n is the number of measurements. So this should make sense, right, that uh, as you gather more data, the standard deviation won't necessarily go down, but the uncertainty on the average time should go down, right? Our intuition tells us that the more data we collect, there should be a smaller uncertainty on the average of that data set. So that's reflected here in the fact that there's this, uh, there's this root n in the denominator. So let's do another example, just getting used to talking correctly about uncertainties. So let's say I've got 30 measurements in my sample, the average time that I measure is 0.797 seconds. My sample standard deviation is 0.025 seconds. Then the error on the mean would be the sample standard deviation divided by root n, right, where n is 30. So that's 0.005 seconds. Uh, ignoring systematic errors, then, I can say that the statistical uncertainty on t bar is 0.005 seconds. Uh, it's the error on the mean. The proper way that I would write the measurement is to write 0.797 plus or minus 0.005 seconds. Now, note here, this is more certain than the previous example that I had given for T5, right? I included three decimal places because the uncertainty is up to the third decimal place. So note that the uncertainty here goes out to the third decimal place, so it makes sense for me to write down three decimal places here for the average value. Uh, just note, you know, that writing 0.797334 or, you know, including other decimal places after the, uns after the decimal place that corresponds to the uncertainties really wouldn't make much sense because who cares about these that it's who cares about the sixth decimal place when the uncertainties are right up here at the third decimal place, right? Um, so that doesn't mean that the uncertainty always has to be just one, one decimal place. Uh, you could put in there 0 0.0047 or something and then include one more decimal place on the average if you wanted to, uh, but it, it just doesn't make sense to put a ton uh, of decimal places on the average value uh, when when they're you're giving a number that's far more precise than the uncertainty warrants. So here there's a 68% chance then that the true value of the average time is between 0.792 seconds and 0.802 seconds. So if another student had measured, say, 
0.809 plus or minus 0 0.009 seconds, you would say that they're consistent because the 68% con confidence intervals overlap between the two of them. So note here, this is different from the previous examples I had given because, well, for, for two reasons, really. One is we're talking about the average time now. The other thing is that here, this person has given you a average time and an uncertainty to compare against. So before I had given you a T5 uh, that a student was trying to compare with your data, and that T5 just had one value, there was no uncertainty on it. So the only thing that you could ask is, how close is that value to my 68% confidence interval? This one is giving you an average value as well as its own 68% confidence interval. So the correct way to approach this is to ask, do the 68% confidence intervals overlap? Even though their central value, 0 0.809, is more than one standard deviation outside of your confidence interval, that's okay because their confidence interval at the low end is 0 0.800, right? That does fall within your 68% confidence interval. So we would say they're consistent. Okay, let's talk for a bit about systematic uncertainties. So this is a totally different kind of uncertainty than statistical uncertainties. Systematic uncertainties are systemic to your experiment, meaning that m taking more data will not help you. They are a property of the experiment itself. So the only way that you can mitigate systematic uncertainties is to design a better experiment. Maybe that means buying better equipment. Maybe that just means being more careful with the measurements that you're making. Maybe it means designing a whole new setup for, for coming to the measurement that you're interested in. They're pretty hard to quantify in most cases. They don't come with closed solution, closed form uh, equations in the way that statistical uncertainties do. And instead of that, you're, instead of using some kind of a formula, you're basically going to follow certain strategies that are helpful. Uh, it's important to think about the sources of systematic error whenever you're doing an experiment. They're um, they're all over the place, and they're not always they're not always um, they're not always difficult to sp spot to point out. So, in the example of the ping pong ball experiment that I've been talking about, if you're using a uh, if you're consistently putting the ball at 102 centimeters rather than 100 centimeters, because we are measuring T, the time between two successive bounces from a ping pong ball dropped from a height of one meter, right? If I'm dropping it from a height of 1.02 meters or 102 centimeters, then I'm introducing a bias and I'm going to measure something that's larger than what I ought to be measuring. And that's a systematic uncertainty that will not go away from taking more data. So biases, experimenter errors that push things in either in one direction, introducing a bias, or that just spread things out would be examples of systematic uncertainties. So in the case of this ping pong ball, the floor in my unfinished basement is a little bit rough. So if I was dropping that ping pong ball into some spots on the floor that have small divots or other spots on the floor that have bumps and ridges on them, that would be another example of a systematic uncertainty that would serve to spread out the distribution a little bit. And Again, taking more data is not going to get rid of that. So here's some strategies for thinking about systematic uncertainties and quantifying them. The simplest one is just that the smallest increment on a measuring device is usually a decent lower bound. Uh, for example, the tick marks on a ruler, um, they give a little bit of a floor on how precise you can be in your measurements. 
that's an example. Oftentimes we just take uh, that as the estimate of our uncertainty. Um, you can compare between different groups to get uh, some measure of some way to quantify the systematic uncertainties. Of course, if you're all using the same equipment, then uh, any systematic error in the equipment won't show up there. But uh, if there's experimenter errors that are introducing systematic uncertainties, they'll likely be different between different groups and a comparison will be helpful for you in figuring out what the group to group level systematics are. Some other examples from the ping pong ball lab would be if somebody has a timer and say they're not really paying attention the first when the first bounce happens on a regular basis but they're really paying attention and, and very quick and hitting that button to stop the timer then they're going to have this systematic bias in their measurements that will make the times shorter and these are all just different examples of systematic uncertainties most of the time we're not going to have precisely quantified systematic errors but it really is important for you to think about the sources of systematic error and to be able to understand wh where these things show up i'm going to be looking for this in lab reports and things like that i want you to think about where do the the uncertainties in my measurements come from and for the most part if you sit and just actually put some thought into it you can come up with some pretty good examples of systematics that contribute to your measurement so i've included here a plot from my thesis actually uh, here's one example of uh, a very rigorous way say of quantifying a systematic error so here i have a plot on the y-axis, it's a mass bias. So here I'm quantifying a bias, right? I'm quantifying the systematic bias in the mass measurements of galaxy clusters. Okay, on the x-axis, it's basically, it's cluster redshift or galaxy cluster redshift. That's just think about it as the distance to the galaxy cluster. And the whole point of plotting it versus distance is just to make sure that there's no overall trend that farther ones are biased more high or more low than ones that are closer. Um, that's an important thing to check. So you can see here, right, I've got a, using all of these points, these are each different galaxy clusters, and I'm quantifying a bias based on simulations in this case. So I'm taking the data sets that we have for each of these different galaxy clusters and then I'm pulling out simulated, uh, I'm basically simulating each one of those galaxy clusters and running the mass measurement codes that I run on my data on these simulations to see how far off from the simulated values are the measured values. And this is the kind of thing that you kind of need to do in order to really rigorously quantify systematic uncertainties. You need something like simulations or some kind of analytical theory to compare against in order to rigorously quantify systematic uncertainties. So they're tough, but they're important. Okay, so the total error then is just the sum of the systematic error and the statistical error, or at least it is for the purposes of physics one and physics two, uh, and well, all intro, all the intro physics courses at MSOE, right? So there's a little asterisk there. Technically speaking, uh, you would have to sum the squares of these terms rather than just adding them linear, linearly. Um, the reason why we don't do this in intro physics courses twofold. One, it's uh, easier to do this simpler form of propagation of error that we'll teach uh, you about, that I will teach you about later. 
And two, you end up with bigger error bars with this version here, which is really nice because you want to have, uh, so students often think that the best thing is to have the smallest error. And that's not necessarily the case. The best thing is to have the accurately quantified error. That's the best thing. Uh, also, we, um, we usually underestimate the, the errors because it's hard to get a handle on the systematic errors. So a lot of times they're just neglected. Uh, and you want to have something, you'd be better off to have something that's larger. So say you're measuring the free fall acceleration due to gravity and you get 9.6 meters per second squared. Well, there's gonna be a question there on that lab packet that's asking you is 9.8 meters per second squared the accepted value within your uncertainties or not, right? And at that point, hopefully your error bars aren't superficially small, and then you have to say, no, my result is not consistent with the accepted value of g. Well, that wouldn't be good, right? You'd rather have your error bars be a little bit larger, so it's more likely that you encapsulate the accepted value within your error bars. So there's two reasons why we choose to use this version. Another thing on notation here. So notation is, uh, is, is hard. Um, and I think the important thing is just to be consistent. So I sometimes write U to stand for uncertainty because that's the way that I learned it. And I think that this, uh, I think there's that the syntax has something going for it, uh, but when it, if I do write this, just remember that I'm referring to the same thing as these deltas, uh, what they're referring to in the lab packets. Um, so that's a bit on notation. I wanted to say something about propagation of error as well. So when you're combining uncertainties from multiple sources of error that are coming together. So for example, let's say you're trying to figure out the error on a velocity measurement and that velocity measurement comes from some distance measurement and some time measurement. Um, propagating the error on the distance and time to the velocity that you derive from that is a bit more complicated than you might expect. And we're gonna talk about that later on in the term. We'll also talk about the uncertainties from curve fitting a little bit more later on in the term. This is a good place to start for now though. So just keep these things in mind. There are other, um, other syntaxes out there. Sometimes you'll see this elongated delta instead of a U or, or uh, sorry, you'll see elongated del instead of a delta or a U to represent uncertainties. So you can keep that in mind. Um, keep also in mind that, that this is not technically exactly right. I don't want you to use this squared term, these, the squared version here, if you have say taken AP statistics or something and you already knew about this before this video, then yes, that's fine if you, if you want to use this. Uh, but like I said, there's some advantages to keeping it, uh, uh, to keeping it linear. Uh, let's just wrap this up. So here's, I, I wanted to just wrap up by talking about where in practice your uncertainties are going to come from for the most part in our labs. Um, so they're mainly gonna come from the sample standard deviation, which we covered earlier and the error on the mean for uncertainties, statistical uncertainties on average quantities. Okay, Excel has uh, this built in. You can use std.s uh, and then the cell range to get the sample standard deviation of cells A1 through A30, right from this example there. Uh, we'll get curve fitting uncertainties as well, quite a bit using regression analyses. So we'll talk about this more in a later video, uh, along with propagation of error. And lastly, I just wanted to point out that the systematic uncertainties are usually gonna dominate the overall error budget. And so we'll invoke different strategies to quantify them when we can and when, they're, uh, when it's necessary. But 
the systematic uncertainties, the main thing that I want you to focus on is understanding the sources of systematic uncertainties. And that usually just comes by sitting down and thinking really hard about where do I think error could creep into this measurement. And if you do that, if you put the effort in, you'll usually be able to figure that out. So make sure to uh, talk about those things, even when you can't quantify them, do talk about them in your lab reports. All right, I hope this is helpful for all of you. Have a nice day. And if you are in my class right now, you will probably want to go on to the other video where we actually take data by dropping this ping pong ball and make these measurements. And I will link to that at the end of this video. Goodbye.